Okay, wonderful. Those were great questions. Really show your understanding. Um, now I'd like to do the meditation, if that's okay. Um, so I'll guide you through it. What I'll ask you to do, so just that you're prepared, this is just a guided meditation in that you may have different ideas that you come up with. Go ahead, reflect upon these points. Those are just suggestions with regard to the topic. But these are all the topics we went through. We'll start by just watching the breath. Breathing in, breathing out. Why? Because now after so much talking and listening, so the mind is a little disrupted. So you can just let go of any disruptive thought by thoughts by just watch the breathing. And then I basically ask you, first of all, I ask you to become aware of your own self. I, I give you some examples where the self, situations when the self is very strong, the sense of I is very strong. But you may choose another situation because I cannot say in your personal case when it's the strongest. So again, your own creativity is asked. And then I ask you to look at the self dependent arising, but also check does the self exist in the way it appears. Okay? And so you go through different steps. Eventually I'll take you to compassion that hopefully with the self gone, in the way I described it, compassion can arise. And at the very end, what I do is, you come to some conclusion at the end of the meditation. This is what you want, some feeling. It moves, it's, it's, it's supposed to move your mind in a certain way. If it doesn't, never mind. But if it does, if you come to some kind of conclusion, I ask you to just focus a few moments on that conclusion and allow for it to sink deeper. To sink deeper so that it's not just an intellectual understanding, but you just, if you just focus on it, single-pointedly, on that kind of conclusion, you actually take it to a de deeper level, which may actually um, influence your actions, such as, in certain actions, be less self-centered, etc., and be more able to be compassionate. So that's the goal of this. Okay, all right, so I'll guide you through it. First, make sure you're comfortable. Most important that your back is straight so that you won't be drowsy or develop back pain. You can also, your legs don't have to be cross-legged if you find that too painful. You may sit in a different way, but as long as you can keep your back straight, that's important. And your arms in a relaxed position. So I assume you've all meditated before. Okay. Head lightly, slightly tilted forwards. Either you keep your eyes slightly open, or if you find that too distracting, you can close your eyes. And then just watch the sensation of the breath, either at your nostrils, or your belly. Take a few moments to focus the mind until I start to guide you through the meditation.
And so now bring to mind a time when the I or the self appears especially strong to your mind. For example, when you narrowly escape an accident, when there is a powerful sense that the eye nearly suffered pain or death, it must be protected. Think of a time when you're embarrassed possibly humiliated before a group of other people Accusing you of something you didn't do. Or bring to mind an occasion when you're highly praised. When you're complimented, complimented or applauded by others. Try to become aware of the sense of a very solid, concrete, and unitary eye that is inherent in you. and needs protection and looking after.
is that sense of a self that turns us into slaves of the mind that thinks, I need this, I need that. I don't want this, I want that. Is that I that makes us run around to fulfill our craving? Makes us work extremely hard to get a promotion, better salary, have a good reputation, certain position and possibly even degree of power or fame That sense of an I never rests. It may fill us with worry and anxiety about what the future will bring. See whether you can get a vivid sense of that eye. Does it feel ever present? And unchanging? Controlling your body and mind?
does it feel as if it could be located somewhere in the body? Maybe in the head? In the region of the eyes? At the heart? somewhere in the belly Although it seems that the eye has some independent, permanent existence, it is just like an optical illusion. Hearing to exist in a way that is not possible. This is because it is a dependently existent entity. dependent on causes and conditions, dependent on parts, and dependent on labeling. So let's, con let's consider the first type of dependence. Since the eye is dependent on causes and conditions, it is not static. But an ever-changing continuum that is never the same from one moment to the next.
constantly changes. In dependence on a myriad of different causes and conditions. Dependence on the karmic actions, we accumulated in the past, dependence on the DNA, we receive from our parents and dependence on external circumstances on our interaction with other people on the things we learn and reflect on, and so on. And then when we consider the second type of dependence, the I cannot exist as a solid, concrete, and unitary phenomenon as it is made up of numerous different parts. It has physical parts, such as a head, a neck, a torso, arms and legs, It is made of bones, blood vessels, muscles, skin and so forth.
And on a subtler level, it is made of trillions of cells. which in turn are composites of countless atoms. The eye further possesses different types of consciousness. The five sense consciousnesses. And the mental consciousness. And then there are numerous types of mental consciousness. Anger, attachment, love, compassion, And there are awarenesses that categorize, analyze, judge, doubt, concentrate, and so on. Yet it is only the labeled, the conventional I that possesses those parts. For the solid, inherent I that appears to us as inherent and independently existent. That cannot be found. It is neither the same as mind and body, nor different from it.
if the eye were, if that eye, that concrete eye that informs all our actions, if that were a one with mind and body, we would end up with more than one eye. And if it were different from mind and body, should be able to remove mind and body and still have an eye. It would also not make sense to say that the eye is the collection of the different body parts and the different types of awareness. For it would mean that if the eye is sick, all the parts of the body and the mind will have to be sick. And if the person or the eye were to wave, all the body parts and the mind would have to wave. So that takes us to the third type of dependence. Dependence on labeling. The eye does neither exist as a solid and inherent entity that is either one or different from mind and body, since it's merely labeled on the basis of its basis of imputation, mind or body.
So when the legs walk, we label I walk. When the mind meditates, we label I meditate. When parts of the body are ill, we say, I'm ill. There's no other self, no other I. apart from the one we label. So since there is no such concrete, solid and inherent I, we are truly free. No I to worry about. To always seek happiness for. To make sure it's liked and appreciated. Instead, we can fully concentrate on the welfare of other sentient beings. First, generate compassion. That is the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering. And the altruistic attitude, thinking 
I myself will work towards freeing other sentient beings from suffering. And eventually, bodhicitta, the wish to become fully awakened so I can be most effective in my striving to lead others to lasting happiness. So now to end this meditation, whatever feeling has arisen in your mind, whatever conclusion you've come to, Spend a few moments just focusing on that. To allow for that to sink deeper into your mind. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> that was a little long. <laughs> I think that was about 40 minutes. I really stretched it. But hopefully I was able to integrate everything we've done so you get a sense of like a summary. And of course it is not enough to think about that and not necessary to torture yourself through a 40 minutes. <laughs> so the way to go about this is actually to really make a change to your life Every day you may learn something new, you read something, and something that, that hits you, something you read something, you listen to something, maybe get a recording or something by Geshe Dorje Damdru or Geshe Yunten, play it in your car, and then one particular point that 
really hits you in that day, start reflecting on that. When you have just a moment of silence, and allow this to sink deeper. And then the next day you take something else, right? Maybe take a teaching by His Holiness, or some other Lama who you, you, you regard to be your teacher, and you listen to that, and again, and you will find every day there's something that strikes you more than something else. And slowly these ideas become part of you and you start changing. And the good thing is you change in a positive way. Less focused on yourself, more focused on others. And I'd like to finish this with some beautiful scientific uh, understanding they have come to in the United States about this group of nuns. I've told you about this. In the United States, that is, there's a group of nuns of Notre Dame, I think they're called, and they are very active in society. They practice compassion and social engagement. And also intellectually, they're very active. And they live to a very high age. As it's been found, they live to a high age. And they're very crystal clear and very good in their what they do. And they ask these nuns to donate their brains to science. And they greet. 600 or something nuns. So... It's not true for all the nuns, but for some of the nuns they found especially active. There was one nun called Sister Bernadette, um, very active to the day she died, very crystal clear, very compassionate, kind, so wisdom and compassion. And they found her brain was totally riddled by Alzheimer, but it hadn't affected her. She was actually able, she didn't know about this, but she had full-blown Alzheimer, but she was extremely kind and compassionate to the day she, she died, and she was very clear. So there's no real explanation, but they say those nuns have given great insights into Alzheimer. So if nothing else, learning about dependent rising Practicing compassion may save you from <laughs> <laughs> dementia and Alzheimer, which is just a very scary disease a lot of people uh, suffer from. So you can actually, again, one of those things you can easily find online. Uh, if it doesn't take us to enlightenment and whatever, but at least that's good news just for this lifetime. Okay, on that note, I'd like to thank all of you.